Hello everyone. Today we talk about continuity and innovation in high medieval uh, agricultural instruments and techniques. Right. This is an important topic because we discussed already uh, the, the broader so-called rebirth of the year 1000. From also from the agricultural point of view. I don't remember the title of the video. If you go into the medieval society playlist, you can easily find that. Um, and we discussed broadly, you know, many related topics, and we stressed indeed uh, the, let's say, uh, anti-technologistic uh, approach that we should take. Broadly speaking, uh, talking about history, like everything that ends in ism is not really very good, right? And for a very long time, and up to a relatively few time ago, actually, the the, the idea that new um, tools and uh, and techniques um, in in this high medieval phase kind of revolution European agriculture and being as individually agents of change right so this concept is naturally wrong uh, as much as we know from not just historically speaking but also from the his specifically from the history of technology but also history of economics and how many other things work fundamentally and uh, but we shouldn't however think that the innovations that, that took mm, place at this night were, were not important or that however they didn't uh, vehiculate in some measure the, the broader change that was occurring for reasons that were fundamentally not technological right the technology definitely had a uh, has a uh, as an in has an impact. It does its own work. It has its own positive impact on the development of a society. But it's just very very small compared to all the causes to bring those technologies to being used. Right. In order to make a technology function, if any, you need um, uh, let's say a fertile background. You need a spin-off, a, a series of activities and of competences and well, knowledge that if you that if in turn are not supported by certain broader political, social, economical uh, bases cannot make that technology apply. Right? Uh, it can't be applicated. So that for example there are technologies that are discovered uh, but remain suspended out there uh, in the air for like one century before they find finally uh, an application. And this is a very interesting perspective if you think about that, because it teaches you um, much more healthily to consider the people who lived at that time not as fundamentally stupid or ignorant or incapable because they hadn't thought, right, uh, like Eureka, about the um, that technology that everybody today on a manual can 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 uh, re uh, through a manual can replicate. But it makes you understand that they they largely knew something that could be. Uh, you know, operated, applied in certain contexts, but especially, but that in, in that case wasn't wasn't functional, because the ratio costs benefits was evidently unfavorable for that technology being developed. Right? It's like a bit like the ancients new steam engine, and many people should, you know accuse things like I don't know because the the ancient world the, 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 uh, accuse the ancient world essentially of have not developed it because they had slavery because of the mindset. None of that. It's simply that it was ineffective. Like it, it was, uh, in order to make a steam engine work to do something practical at the time, uh, you you needed all uh, a series of components um, that simply at the time they didn't have. What do you think that industrial, so-called industrial revolution, was born in 18th century England? Right? Have you ever wondered that? Because there was already um, a, a set of uh, of circumstances, a, a satellite acti a satellite activities that could support, for example, building certain components, um, let's say, um, enclosing steam power into certain um, uh, spaces and, and and not to 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 let it go and to channel it into uh, into engines, etc. That it's it's not about the knowledge of steam engine. That in fact was known since ancient times. It was about having finally that spin-off that allowed you to applicate this to. You know, if the the English hadn't imported so so much cotton, for example, from India, and uh, their manufacturers were basically um, uh, incapable of um, of working it all together, uh, they would have not um, 
applicated their their time and and and, and the resources to develop the steam engine in that in that context and that's also why other areas also of of uh, of the world at the time took some time before getting industrialized not just bec not much because they didn't know how to to make that but simply because they maybe they didn't have enough resources to to build that machinery or for the broader political socio economical balance certain activities were 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 still good for the local standards like so that's the the general perspective the general frame the general optic you have to to look at at this change right today therefore we do not want to attribute to this um, agricultural tools and techniques more importance than the one they actually had in fact at the end we will observe how uh, especially measuring the crop rate um, not much objectively changed during the, uh, let's say the middle ages in stri in strictly technologically speaking right but yet uh, you can see that there were certain innovations that were uh, applicated in certain uh, contexts because of certain needs that were you know that needed to to be met um, also through this components right so um we have to consider the progress that agricultural practice um produced between the eleventh and the thirteenth century um strictly in in a neatly prevalent quantitative nature right um during the high middle ages there was a lot of change there was a lot of growth right in the european continent o especially also a lot of expansion which is different just from merely growing it means to to really having the, the abilities to to replicate the system that makes you grow and to to to, to build the basis for further structures that you can implement this is something that in europe especially in western europe happens uh, very very speedily for medieval standards other areas of Europe and the Mediterranean do not have this um, and in general we, we won't be explaining the causes of this but we can say that um, much of this has to do also with the wealth distribution and it's not just about the sheer amount of of quantity uh, of, of, um, of resources you can find it depends on uh, how people how societies are structured how politics works uh, a lot of factors in fact are very very difficult to to say you know to quantify properly but what changes indeed is that um, this agricultural uh, growth and expansion uh, was accompanied let's say in this uh, sense by tools and techniques that knew um, an improvement over time from from a cultural point of view right um and um and 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 that therefore generated uh even up to recent past th those myths um about the so called uh revolution in the systems of of cultivation during the central centuries of the middle ages right there was nothing like a revolution everything went uh very slowly more or less in the same way it had always gone um the greater changes under this profile are mostly political and social right also economical of course but technologically speaking the thing um was built on the base of this other larger factors not on 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 what the you know the, the benefit of this technologies was could, could offer right that it was just a minor part overall right and it's important to to understand economics uh, in this terms because it also makes you understand the the value of what we have and we, what we can produce today with the responsibility that we have now because we have extremely powerful means that really can be that do not escape this perspective as well because they need uh, certain favorable conditions to be um, to exist in the first place but also it makes you understand how difficult it is to grow economically speaking right For, since the industrial revolution up to the early 2000s we have fundamentally um, believed in, in the myth of eternal growth of eternal progress like this idea that doesn't matter what the important is that your GDP grows um, uh, that rate and that stays like that but you know 
the world of reality doesn't necessarily follow this, and, and not just because I don't know there are corrupt politicians or you know society is messed up or whatever. Um, there are certain intrinsic physical limits in this world that cannot make you grow in infinitely, right? And of course, within the political and social dimension, we can do a freaking lot to make things work better. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but still, you know, you can't rocket to the stars. Like, uh, I don't know, even, I'm pretty young, but I remember when I was a kid, we said, ah, oh, you know, in the uh, 2020 now, we, we would be living on Mars and eating, you know, instead of a dish of normal meal, like pills that would satisfy all of our um, <laughs> food needs and all, and all this, this stuff. Obviously, we're still there. We're still here, I mean. <laughs> we're not still there. Um, but we are about to, to get there, but still with enormous costs and with um, the expectation that, that everything will, will, will grow realistically accordingly, right? Um, and definitely looking at history, so nobody knows Nobody can predict how things will go. Unfortunately, we can estimate uh, things, but history can, I mean, the world can go in, in very, very different directions. And much, much more quickly, especially the more, um, the more society grows complex. And this is particularly important. The, the, the more the system expands, and the more it's difficult to predict in which direction it will go. And this is not comforting at all, because obviously we have means to kind of um, organize our society and uh, I think human civil civilization has um, an idea of what control means after all, right? So that uh, even given our current problems we're not so badly uh, uh, put uh, as certain people believe, but it, there are equally extremely dramatic problems that we have to address and also that do not get addressed so the importance is remain open, like remain in balance between two health positions uh, sticking to science, sticking to statistics and especially getting however um, realistic about what can happen right, not taking the extreme of what can happen as mashed against the, the printer <laughs> my, my hands or um, um, but um, um, it, and bringing it to, to the extreme, so we'll say like in, in, in 20 years we will be all underwater. No, it will not happen, right? Um, and, but um, also having the, the knowledge of our, of our limits, right? And not pretending to know things, because people who pretend to know things for sure normally are idiots, right? In, kind of intelligent people always question everything that they are. Um, and you don't have to grow skeptical either. Like right? you have to, to, you need to 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 leave some fixed points that on which you have to orientate yourself. As long as you contemplate the opportunity of these points to to move at one point, and that it, and, and what happens is not that those points move most of the times, but that you add that you pass to to other levels of understanding that you know make you elevate through through some sort of uh, broader understanding, also with a broader picture of of the wall, right? So, uh, the Middle Ages, uh, you know, you can hear impressive things like if we were talking about m average medieval standards, um, a peasant would work all of his life without actually perceiving at the end of it, uh, at the end of the saying, how much he had gained, right? Because, you know, it was the growth was estimated in something, something like a four. Uh, per, uh, four percent in a lifetime, so it's not a big change, is it? Um, naturally, certain medieval contexts are different. There are entire generations that came that, that change um, substantially their, their living standards. Uh, there are also situations in which things reverse, and the Middle Ages begin in the broader frame that we give to it with uh, you know the contraction of what the late antique uh, kind of Hellenistic world had managed to produce and, uh, and that was largely based on demographic, agricultural and in fact economical matters. Um, technology rides this, this, uh, these waves like you know the, the, the point with technology is that there's not a wrong or a right technology but there is the, the one that 
contingently speaking, uh, serves to something. So when you see the the concept of uh, regression, right, at the beginning of the Middle Ages, well, it's a bit of a progressist idea, like a mindset that, that things regress because there's been a sort of involution that has to do with the intrinsic values of, of a civilization. No, because what early medieval people did was one of the most the, the most intelligent thing could be done at the time, like reverting on certain different bases, let's say better, that that worked for, for what um, resources were were, were were available, right? So that's the real point. You can't say, oh, technology regressed, these were a bunch of idiots because they didn't know how to do things anymore. No, you are an idiot and do not understand how to live uh, in, in a moment in history and why certain things happen. Those guys knew their business and you don't. So this is the general uh, mindset you have to, 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 to have when, if you think such, such, you know, uh, I, don't even, I don't even know how to define that. Um, However, and this is what we will be talking about today, there were these uh, significant novelties, let's put it in those terms, as you sum of them, um, that is important to mention, to make mention of. Uh, and um, especially in, um, in the primary sector of production, the serial one, right? That is worth mentioning, it was the base of the economy of the time. So, in the high Middle Ages, so the central centuries of the Middle Ages, there was the widespread of the um, malt board plow that was provided with coulter and sometimes even with wheels, even though um, it, it was, you know, heavier and therefore le less um, easy to, to use. Uh, it definitely introduced into the uh, farmer uh, equipment a tool of certainly greater effectiveness than the simple plow. It was instead symmetrical. It mostly came from the Mediterranean tradition and now we'll also see why. And that had dominated uh, Europe in general in uh, the, the centuries before roughly the year 1000. So when you hear the revival of the year 1000, always remember that a great century of revival ha had actually been the tent, and, and much of what we see st starting to happen in, in, from our perspective in 1000 is telling the truth, the consequence of a prior development that we can't track simply because there are not enough sources by that time, or at least the system has, hasn't still produced enough to, produ to produce certain sources but the roots are before and generally speaking the, or, or already from the 8th century especially certain areas of, of Europe had you know the, you, you, you could have experienced this, this timid but kind of steady growth right and and the period of second invasions wasn't seemingly that disruptive for European economy as we think about it. That, that because of course certain regions were hit and they were hit pretty damn hard. But overall this also put in motion a set of um, not just of mere, uh, this is not just about you know uh, economy or production strictly meant, but it's also a, a way of how you organize the, the uh, you organize society. Um, also all these wars had objectively created probably a better organization at a local level. It started bearing its, I mean, providing its fruits at, uh, later on um, in um, in a way, in fact, that Europe began to expand. And, and the roots of this phenomenon are probably very, very overlooked. It's a relatively recent uh, historiographical um, field of interest, let's say, um, to, to, to look how, how objectively this very highly fragmented Europe from a political point of view was able to produce so much compared especially in part to the same like in the Byzantine world or the Islamic world um, that also experienced similar dynamics but and they surely grew at this time but they also they however they had less expansive capabilities 
than Western Europe. That is particularly interesting. So, um, another characteristic was the the cutting uh, some certain cutting elements um, to of, of of the plow to to cut through the, the surface of the land. There was proper of um, actually also of the uh, of the simple plow uh, at this point, while the the heavier one added uh, instead the the malt board in fact and uh, the plow share that were often asymmetrical that could uh, simply uh, revert uh, reverse the the sods mm, and therefore to achieve a deeper renewal of the of the soils uh, an effect that otherwise could be obtained only through repeated and crossed um, plowing right that obviously required more more work over time um, and the affirmation of the uh, malt board uh, plow uh, wasn't um, wasn't registered everywhere, uh, nor um, in in the same times, right? And and taking into consideration that recurring to such instruments didn't exclude in several regions the use of uh, less complex plows at, at the same time. So this was a very progressive phenomenon. Why did it happen? Well, it, we we explained this that this changes not just for the plow but for other Agricultural tools, simply because of more um, more resor available resources, right? And uh, in part, from the other side, we, we're we're taking a look also the uh, senior the seigneurial system that we discuss a lot over time in the uh, the rationalization of uh, investments and of land exploitation. That render available available um, you know those capitals into a, the hands of fewer people that could invest into kind of better technology on some occasion, um, and this explains in part why other areas or the same areas sometimes remain with different types of of agricultural tools, um, but also how this um, improvement wasn't much of a great technological achievement, but rather a great achievement of a system of production that was. At this point, dominated uh, was dominating Latin Germanic Europe. There was the Vassalatic uh, beneficiary system of Frankish origin, right? Um, so today we, we will focus on certain areas: uh, Italy, France, and parts of Central Europe and England. So starting from Italy, that is kind of an interesting area because it's um, it's not so well documented, but it's very diverse. Uh, it's very diversified within its own boundaries, and um, it's obviously uh, you know a, a land of between fundamentally the Mediterranean and Central Europe, especially in certain regions. Um, so Italy at this time um, during High Middle Ages has relatively scarce data, right? Or even worse, fundamentally, even less. So, looking, uh, uh, taking a broader look, um, we have we, we can observe what 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 the ag local agricultural system was between the the 14th and 15th century. So we won't be talking today just about the the High Middle Ages proper, but looking at also at other uh, other either previously or previous or uh, subsequent times. So the symmetric plow of pre-Roman derivation uh, continued to be the uh, instrument in use in the regions of the Tyrrhenian coast, right? Um, chiefly the like in southern Italy, in the islands, while the Po Valley and other lands of the uh, Adriatic coast, instead in the east. Um, Imposed um, so the, the the imposition of a of another instrument known as the plovus. Uh, it was a heavier uh, plow. It was asymmetric as well, and uh, also provided with wheels that 
uh, actually uh, is represents a typology that was already known since the times of Plinius and and also uh, later on in the Longobard laws, right? And an intermediate type between the uh, light plow and the uh, plovus seems to have been the so-called perticarus that um, although given provided with with a coulter and um, with an asymmetric plow share um, didn't have however wheels right it didn't have the wheels so um, the presence of this typology is uh, attested uh, by the way in the uh, area of Lombardy and uh, Veneto and the marches and in other regions of the center such as Umbria and Tuscany so the adaptation to uh, the needs of by um, more robust um, plowing instruments um, and also the necessity of uh, more rapid execution of the works in front of the multiplication of the uh, seminative areas areas with the expansion of uh, you know the count uh, say arable land through deforestation um, bonifications etc um, determine certain important changes in animal traction and they um, determine um, this changes not much relatively um, to the uh, the traction but also the um, the mounting systems and of the um, recurring to um, shoeing like iron shoeing for for the animals so in the Mediterranean countries the ox continued to be the uh, traction the drawing animal per excellence right um, but um, in certain regions for, for example like Italy once again there are uh, witnesses of uh, the employment of cows and uh, in presence of heavy and uh, poor uh, badly drained uh, terrains also of buffaloes in the cereal terrains of the povalate made their appearance in the late middle ages also horses um, which uh, underlines even more the characteristics of this region that can be considered as across the um, Central European and Mediterranean agriculture and obviously the weight of the uh, plows uh, in use starting from the 11th and 12th century rendered ended up to in rendering necessary the uh, updating uh, of other techniques for example the connection of more animals um, and uh, increasing uh, through that the distance between those who could afford the equipment the equipment for a light plow and uh, those instead who could afford instead the um, the better uh, say they could benefit of the uh, the fullest of the progress of techniques right so differently from the south also central and northern Europe witnessed um, especially since the 12th century as slow um, as much as partial substitution of the bovine uh, draw um, with the um, equine one um, in the 13th century uh, horses were the main uh, traction animals uh, in the agriculture of the, the the richest regions such as the Ile de France, uh, Picardy, uh, the Flanders and Lorraine and it's likely that the higher cost of the horse and of its maintenance um, and the fact that the 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 horse more than, than the ox was un underwent the illnesses and that shows that 
these factors could be could were were perceived were, were understood to be compensated by the speed of the animal right so that granted it was more delicate in some ways but it granted um, a more effective resp response to to the needs of intensive cultivation and also by the uh, fair success that in the presence of a temperate cold climate um, uh, especially the cultivation of oat um, could um, could could have uh, oat was among the cereals the most apt to the equine uh, feed right for what concerns the ox instead the perfection of the mounting system consisted in making the yoke not pressing on the withers um, on the wither by fixating it with a with a strap uh, around the neck but rather on on the forehead by um, fastening it to the like uh, fixating it attaching it to the to the horns right and the use to show the uh, plow horses um, is relatively documented uh, starting already from the 11th century and the, the showing for the bovines is instead uh, was to spread later in the agricultural practice of the centuries we we're talking about um, definitely the plow uh, uh, covered like had definitely a, a very important fundamental role right but um, for this reason we don't have to underestimate the contribution of other tools such as the hose or the uh, spades um, harrows, sickles, um, s uh, hay sites, um, uh, etc. that uh, with um, through which and uh, sometimes also in, in its absence composed the equipment of the medieval farmer agriculture uh, reflecting um, themselves in a certain measure the progressive improvement of a um, of the agrarian technology that uh, took place between the 11th and the 13th century in this centuries iron also started to be more available right uh, the production of iron was a consequence of uh, also of uh, the progress of extraction techniques that allowed uh, both to dispose of uh, of uh, rendering available a larger amount of tools and also to increase their effectiveness and resistance by recurring more largely to this metal and that has a cost and that explains why I don't know in the early middle ages uh, for example metals were were so so expensive so that's also why certain tools weren't developed before with certain characteristics and components then talking about the cultural cycles so w we we consider from one side the technological innovation that as we've seen were of a modest impact overall but um, very very important at the same time were these um, uh, uh, forms of broader organization of agriculture um, that were naturally um, intertwined with the, the general improvement also of technology etc and they um, very important however more important than the, the same tools were this um, systems of um, of agricultural work and this new organization of spaces um, so the reference is obviously to this the, the spread of these cultural cycles that once again are not of a, much of an invention but they're simply the rationalization um, and um, the descent from the rationalization and intensification of agricultural practice directed by the vassalitic beneficiary system um, and um, agriculture was coming at this time to, to become more extensive right that, that is that um, more land was owned by fewer people and this brought to certain 
different broader forms of management that had to maximize profits on a, on a kind of a larger scale, right? There, there are certain things you can do um, as a great landowner that the individual small or medium landowner cannot do because it cannot coordinate easily, at least with with other uh, individuals of their uh, of their same uh, wealth, right, and possession. Um, so it, it's this probably this centralization of vassalatic beneficiary agricultural um, management that that favored such cultural cycles overall, and um, especially we we witness from the mid 12th century the progressive affirmation of the triennial um, the three years rotation of the cultures and the cultivations and the shrinking in parallel of the surfaces um, that are governed instead according to the traditional biennial cycle so by um, two years or three years rotation we 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 mean the uh, land exploitation system for which uh, by in order to protect its own productivity so the biennial rotation was already known uh, in the ancient times and it had remained somewhat typical of certain areas during the early middle ages where there were you know, kind of more primitive systems of of, uh, of culture very simply you know one half of the terrain was was cultivated the other one left as fallow land right and the uh, usually uh, the, the this followed a seasonal change like very simple one between the, the cold season the warm season something like that and uh, differently the um, the triennial rotation um, entailed that only one third of the land was left to, to rest during a certain time of the year and the other two thirds were uh, destined instead to different types of cultures fundamentally it would be uh, wheat uh, and um, rye barley uh, winter barley in the in the other point, uh, the other part was left to spring cultures that could be um, both cereals, so so like uh, oat, for example, um, um, spring barley, or millet, uh, for example, or sorghum, and others, then um, legumes. The more um, needy cereal uh, especially relatively to the soils and that therefore also was more more precious was usually uh, left um, for the for that land that third of land that had uh, left fallow right um, so the and, and, and at the same time the um, spring uh, and, and winter uh, cultures uh, w alternate one with other, right? And uh, from so also with legumes and other cultures. Given that, for example, legumes have this property of fixating the nitrogen in the terrain, and they uh, they were very important for preserving the productive capacities of the same terrain. So from what we have seen in here, um, the fact of uh, the, the triennial rotation de facto granted two harvests every uh, three years. And um, also because it also favored, by the way, um, especially if uh, uh, an equilibrated distribution of the agricultural organization, such as the you know, these three spaces could be left respectively for plowing, for sowing, for harvesting, like through the, the same years. Uh, 
and and therefore it um, the, the, the especially thanks to this alternation of winter and spring cultivation the risk that the agricultural was exposed to in terms of eventual famines etc due to maybe unfavorable climatic uh, conditions was was rel relatively lower right? in France the triennial cycle of the culture is witnessed even if in a somewhat imperfect form since the Carolingian age and um, and it took um, over um, significantly from the, the 13th century onwards um, it given its uh, it's witness to have been practiced both in Normandy and in the fertile lands of the Ile de France and from this view also started appearing in the south um, in a few times started appearing also in the south of the country in England uh, the first uh, attestment of uh, of the triennial rotation um, date back instead to the mid 12th century during the 13th the attestations become multiple right but this does not however configurate in any way the abandonment of the biennial cycle um, by the way the, the, the precocious heat of the uh, Mediterranean springs and also the dryness and and uh, droughts of the summers um, didn't allow southern Europe a differentiation between um, especially the, the spread of the of the spring cereals right uh, at least not in the same measure that it had in the other uh, areas of the center and north of Europe as a result um, the the adoption of the triennial cycle was uh, limited looking at the crop rates uh, of cereals um, so looking at the relation between the um, you know harvested cereal and the sowed one um, can um, show pretty clearly that in spite of the technical cultural progress that we have highlighted during the high and low middle ages there weren't after all particularly important increases uh, there was a, any particularly important increase um, in general and uh, in, in certain areas was no in improvement of it at all uh, sadly enough and for for England for example between the 13th and the beginning of the 14th century um, there is a beautiful research um, carried out by Jan uh, Tato if, I, if I'm not wrong on the uh, crops relatively crop rates relative to the to about 20,000 uh, registered harvests in the accountable in, in the um, account books of the properties of uh, Winchester's bishop that showed how the yearly uh, let's say the, the the profit actually the, the crop rate were were in decline and um, also about England there is a research by Poston that came to hypothesize that there was even um, a a fall of the crop rate um, in in England specifically in uh, the centuries of the high and low Middle Ages, um, especially after the progressive exhaustion of those terrains of ancient cultivation. Unfortunately, not all regions are so well documented like England. For example, for Italy, the development of such a documentation doesn't exist but at the beginnings of the 14th century if we take a look at the, at the crop rates of Piedmont for example both for the wheat and 
minor serials um, they they do not surpass much like the two or three per one that evokes immediately the uh, early medieval scenario agriculturally speaking and at the same time however the region around Luka for example during the 12th and 13th century uh, on the base of a wide approximation was um, proposed to 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 have a cereal crop rate of a uh, of of three per one minimum right uh, which is not bad fundamentally so um this wall data you know s sometimes you read very different things telling the truth um uh, elsewhere I had read telling the truth that that certain crop rates were increasing uh particularly especially in England. Uh, that here instead, you know, tells you that 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 is not the case. Looking at these two scholars, we have mentioned, so it, it's it's how much that is complicated. And the reason why it's complicated to calculate all this stuff is that um, we don't have a, a structural evidence of sort. Like you can have a maybe a, a locality that is very well documented. But then you, you look around and you realize that you don't know a lot about what is happening elsewhere. Um, so you have different researchers with different methods, with different approximations, right? Oh, never, never underestimate in this sense the impact that um, uh, ap approximating, not just in the calculation, uh, say trying to fill those gaps that the the datum that does not offer you, but but also the the general interpretation that the authors, the, the, the historians want to have this um, can have a huge impact, right? That can really disrupt your um, your your perspective at the end of the day, because that's what makes a lot of difference in, in studying this stuff. So w when you confront uh, you you compare the various uh, researches, you you start um, realizing that there is not a clearly defined situation in that in general however we, we don't necessarily have to think about um, a qualitative improvement right uh, also one could say that you know the, the, the larger the agricultural systems became and the more they burnt in in absolute terms and this is this is possible right you know the concept is that uh, in in actually in absolute and in relative terms, because this is a problem of the latifundium, like of the large um, uh, sharecropping. Uh, like sharecropping was also uh, telling the truth. We we made a video on share uh, on uh, sharecropping. That was that was a kind of a profitable system, but there were other areas, especially most feudalized uh, areas. It was they were like big latifundia fundamentally, and and these are. Um, Lands that render a certain amount of wealth, also with relatively archaic systems of work, and and the noblemen already live like that. They do not need um, to in, to invest too much in this production. While the, the maybe the, not maybe the smaller landowner, but maybe the middle landowner has a greater um, you know, ability to, um, let's say, to to invest, to to know what's better for producing, actually for maximizing the land. So there is probably a balance between um, own, owning a very small amount of land that you can cultivate, but that remains fundamentally just limited to, to your, particularly to your self-consumption. So probably there's not much about market, and of course things can expand. But also in the manner, moment in which they expand, you have to see in there how then you exploit the land because you're not hungry anymore, and uh, you you also start losing more, administratively speaking, in this production. So the the concept is very controversial because we don't know. I mean, in terms of how can we quantify these outcomes? Because there there are so many factors that we know nothing about that can uh, really uh, create a lot of problems. So those areas like England, for example, for which there was a pretty sound administration that could produce sources. Well, they're they're beautiful because 
I imagine for people who study these things, um, there is a great deal of, um, let's say, you know, it, it's a, one of the best documented areas, so it, it's cool. But at the same time, um, it um, it's limited. It's a limited form, sometimes even of approaching these sources. And, um, and we, we should know more also about the market, about population, about currency, you know, a lot of other stuff that often is not known. Um, so different systems also produce different societies. Uh, we, we mentioned today France, especially northern France and northern Italy, that were in fact since the 8th century kind of the, the most advanced agricultural areas, uh, you know, in terms of f forms, especially of land exploitation in Europe. And these regions produce two very different societies and, and political systems because, in fact, of the land distribution. France had a freaking lot of land in the hands of a freaking few people. Uh, Italy had, had a more even land distribution. Well, in France you see the, the rise of the uh, feudal kingdom per excellence, some of the most trans centralized systems of the time. In Italy, you find city states rising, right? So, it, obviously, there are other factors that have to be taken into account because there were also similarities, of course. But let's say that um, all medieval society at this point is based on the, on, on agriculture, right? Or like all pre-industrial societies. So, if you really want to understand what's going on um, at any time in history in the in the societies, and you have to look at how land is um, is fundamentally administered and how much it renders and whatever. So, this is particularly important in, in any case, even if you're not interested in stuff. I, I myself don't don't know very much, and probably from this video was quite evident because my say sound bo extremely boring. Um, but uh, it's actually very fascinating and, um, and it tells you so much that you cannot ignore and that's why I venture, even though I am I'm a military historian, I venture into these heels because indeed uh, if you don't understand this you can't understand anything else uh, about this society. You, you have just a, kind of an abstract picture of what things were like and if you don't connect into this hard this real hardware, really, um, it's a very materialist approach from history. Indeed, these uh, studies start mostly from, um, you know, th there's been the, the Ecole des Annales, the, all these kind of Marxist influenced, uh, uh, let's say, schools that, that cared about the, 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 the capitals and the means of production, all this stuff, for political reason, but that produced objectively a, an inter a very interesting. Um, historiographical branch about, in fact, history of economics that for a long time was ignored uh, historically in Western society. So, uh, the, the task of the historian is bringing all this stuff together, uh, picking a bit from everyone, from all these elements that we can't take into consideration. Also, never think that, I don't know, ideas uh, do not change, but also be aware of the fact that that ideas are products of a context, right? So that that is often influenced by material aspects of the story as well, and vice versa. Like meaning that you can make a very different use of what you have, materially speaking, on the basis of what you think. That is also very very important as well. And who's right, who's wrong, who knows, right? This was the ancient uh, debate between Marx and and Weber, in fact, and and actually. Uh, the schools of these respective thinkers never never denied that uh, respectively that there was a, a an ideal and a material influence in how history goes on, on society the, the way it develops but obviously th they were biased um, or biased but because th today it was corrected rightfully about this uh, relatively to uh, what uh, I mean, for, for this, about the measure of what which these influences were. So, um, yeah, and generally when I make these videos, I always live with this consideration because, as far as I know, a bit of gossip, like, you know, people who study <laughs> history of economics, etc., it's, it's like one of the fields in which there is um, 
some of the, the the least consensus in absolute terms like especially I don't want to say modern economics but let's say uh, because I have my ideas on modern economics and fundamentally follow the the, 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 the school of Vienna I'm, I'm a classic liberist I, I could say um, it's classic economy and uh, that, that's how to me things work um, but um, the the concept to me but because it's more complicated but it often but it always gets down to that in my opinion but when it takes like history of I don't know currency in the ancient world or medieval world I mean as far as I know that there is someone who says something and someone who, who says the exact opposite obviously like in all fields there is a middle ground in which uh, the greater part of the consensus lays but in general it seems that these systems are much more difficultly interpretable than, than any others at this point but but um, because of the same because of the lack of resources not because the, the, the matter is so overwhelmingly complicated compared to other ones but it's because um, we lack so many elements that we need to to understand clearly what was going on and then I want I don't want to be excessive in here probably you know there are so many uh, historians of economics that, that that have clear ideas on this but the clearest idea is um, for a historian is to realize the limits also of the knowledge that we have so that that's where with that middle ground consensus probably lays um, so what else can we say about this? Well, I think we said more or less everything. The part in the rotations were pretty messed up in the way I explained it. But today I'm lazy. I don't know why, and uh, it came out like that. But you know, you you complain that I I make too long videos. So at least this one will be shorter for someone's taste uh, to to be satisfied. All right. Uh, so for now let's stop it here I hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye